every winter about the time of the full moon, an extraordinary event takes place in the cold waters of southern Australia. Thousands of spider crabs march into shallow water, gathering together in large groups to molt their shells. The cast of crabs stretches as far as the eye can see. One of nature's great spectacles. But they don't arrive unnoticed. And not all will survive the march. As crabs wash ashore, locals gather to view the spectacle. Marine naturalist Pang Kwong has been coming here every winter for more than four decades to record the behaviour of these crabs. All right, we'll see you guys. Will we see you? Okay, mate. And apparently he's a crab or two out here. But from my experience, I've seen the spider crabs aggregate between late Christmas right through to June. The June one they will aggregate and they will begin their molt and they will stay in the one spot for a, a lot longer period of time than they normally would do. The arrival of the crabs attracts divers and predators. There are two species of stingray in the bay. This one is a smooth or short-tailed ray. There's safety in numbers and the spider crabs gather in the shallows to mould their hard outer shell or carapace so they can grow bigger protected by a new shell. First the shell splits at the back and the crab wriggles backwards to extract itself. It can take half an hour or more during which time the crab is at its most vulnerable. Eventually the head appears, but its eight legs are still trapped and the crab is buffeted around by the tide and currents as it tries to free itself. Finally, all of its legs are out. If they're hungry, a, a hard shell one will eat a soft shell one. But one thing I have noticed is in, when they come together as your aggregation, if one does begin molting early, the others climb all over it. It looks like they're trying to pull them out of the shell to assist them get out of that shell. That's how it looks. I've always been fascinated by that since I've been watching them. The crab appears somewhat dazed and tries to head for the protection of the mound. But the smooth rays are on the prowl and constantly check all the mounds for newly emerged crabs. This one passes over the mound of unmolted crabs with their hard outer shell, searching for soft-shelled ones, and finds our little crab before it can hide.
It's thought the crab's mass to increase the survival odds of individual crabs. It's not really known what triggers the molt, but early molters are more often at risk as they stand out. Soon, the mounds break up, and en masse, the crabs head to the refuge of the nearby pier. The raft stretches for hundreds of metres. The rays tag along, but at the pier, other dangers await. The cavalcade of crabs attracts fishermen. Humans throw wire nets from the pier, hoping to snare a crab with chicken carcasses as bait. The crabs unwittingly run the gauntlet. But the baits often break away, littering the seabed with plastic ties, carcasses and lost nets. As the crabs are marching, they're always eating. They eat anything, they'll eat leaven-armed starfish. But their main role, I believe, is to actually keep weed growth under control. So they're munching on, chewing on anything they can eat. And even if they hit a jetty, they'll eat the uh, sponges off the pylons. It's not known why they gather under jetties, but it may be to get out of the reach of the rays, or maybe they're positioning themselves in some way in the current. The crab's instinct is to climb and you, you can often find them on the markers out in the bay. They'll climb up there and every now and then I've had a look at those markers and there might be eight, nine, ten crabs be up there on the pylons. The rays that you'll see around jetties are basically resident rays, resident to uh, Port Phillip Bay, but they will, they will travel miles if they can smell food and they'll be drawn in from all around the bay and you can, get, you can get 20 or 30, at least. After an hour or two, Pang emerges from the chilly 12 degree water to warm up before going back in. So, Pang, what's happening under the pit? They're actually, uh, the spider crabs are starting to molt now, en masse. So pretty much two out of three molt and the stingrays are eating the poor buggers as they're coming out of the shells. So, uh, what, up on the pylons? They come up the pylons here, and they're actually getting the ones on the base of the pylons. So you'll see them lifting up to chop them off. So. The rays check for suitable crabs to eat with their sensitive rostrum, passing over ones with hard shells and selecting others. Stingrays have no bones, but their skeletons are made of flexible cartilage. Their eyes are on top of their bodies and their mouths underneath, so they use smell and electroreceptors to find their prey. They have gills on their underside and vestigial gill slits called spiracles located behind their eyes. These act like valves to help them breathe while they rest on the bottom. Instead of sucking sandy water in through their gills, spiracles pull clear water in then force it out through the gills below.
As more and more crabs festoon the pylons, the spectacle is an irresistible attraction to not only the rays, but also to local divers, photographers and filmmakers from all over the world. With 20 smooth rays around the pier now, Pang is fascinated but wary. Rays that will come to a jetty that aren't used to divers will react differently than the local rays. They're all got their own personality. Some, some are placid, some are sort of a bit always shy, but others stick their tail up and say, I'm tougher than you, stay away. You, you've got to be a bit wary of the ones you don't recognise. You've got to respect them. Or when they've got to barb like a, like a dagger. The interesting thing about rays is that they're really, really reluctant to use that barb. They're more interested in getting away. Fishermen, when they catch a ray, they're trying to remove their hooks. They've got to be very careful. So what they, they generally do is they'll be pretty harsh on the way they remove that hook, or they may even cut the tail off to avoid the barb. It's a week since the crabs arrived at the jetty and stingrays are everywhere gathered for the feast. A mucous membrane protecting the body of the crab from the inside of the shell is discarded as the ray grinds up the spider crab. The ray's plate-like teeth are adapted to crushing prey. But what triggers the crabs to molt? From my experience, what I've noticed is that the mass molt begins after a change of weather, particularly if it comes up rough, and on the full moon because of the faster or stronger currents. They need to come into the shallows because when they start to molt, the actual action of the waves actually helps them come out and exit their shell. So as soon as the crab begins to molt, the back of the shell cracks and then I think body fluids ooze out and the rays detect that the molt's about to begin and they just come and eat them. Rays have special gel-filled pits across the front of their face, called ampullae of Lorenzini, which allow them to pick up electrical signals made by other animals when they move. But for the final kill, they use scent to draw the soft flesh of the malted crab into their mouth, then progressively dismantle the crab by discarding the hard bits of carapace as they go. As they start mass molding, the rays can't keep up. They're so full of crabs that they're eating. And that now allows some to pop out of the shell and roll away and not get eaten. Because the rays are slowed down. They're eating every one they get their mouths on. The smooth stingray is the largest of all stingrays in Australia. Some individuals can live up to 50 years, growing to over four metres in length, with a wingspan of two metres across and weighing up to 350 kilograms. As the days pass, the large red crabs dangling from the pylons, waiting for their shells to toughen up, are ones that have already molted. They have pumped their bodies with water and their new shells have hardened, 
These crabs are of no further interest to the rays. They're less vulnerable and finally safe. They feed amongst the tendrils of kelp, preparing for their journey back to deeper water. As the number of molting crabs decline, the frenzy of feeding rays continues, intent on getting the final pickings. At the eastern end of the pier, Pang spots a scrap heap of shells. What we found was just outside the jetty was a, was a sandy gully that had been created by years of current. And what was happening was the crabs that had molted or had been washed into this gully and piled up on, on each other. Then the rays came in and they started gorging on these crabs. And the crabs couldn't get out of the gully and uh, yeah, there was just a big feast. Soon after their molt, the spider crabs disappear. No one knows for sure where they go or when they will return to the shallows. There are many mysteries about their life, but what we do know is that this annual migration of thousands of spider crabs is one of the great spectacles of the natural world.